So Arden is going to be um, talking with us today. I hear you, Kitty, really listening and responding to what your cat is telling you. Um, Arden Moore happily wears many collars in the pet world, host of the award-winning O Behave show on Pet Life Radio, host of Meowie Hour, presented by the CFA, best-selling author more than two, for, of more than two dozen and counting books, master certified pet first aid instructor, Catster Magazine column, columnist, fear-free pet certified professional, in-demand speaker, and proud pet parent to the furry Brady Bunch. That <laughs> includes pet safety cat Casey. She's been a feline advocate since childhood when her first cat, Corky, happily swam with her in the backyard <laughs> lake. Um, and I will say I took or Arden's pet first, her cat first aid class with my daughter and my niece, and they had their cats, uh, Maggie and Lily, and they both graduated. Um, and <laughs> I would say Arden did an, an incredible job. She is tireless, full of energy. It was a thrill to part participate in that class. Um, I can't recommend it more than I'm recommending it right now. Uh, both of my my kids my niece learn something new about their cats and they really feel like they're going to be much more successful cat parents as a result of that course so arden thank you for making me not worry about my kids with their cats and um and i am going to hand everything over to you i believe well before we get into the slideshow i just want to give a big pause up to all of you guys thank you thank you thank you for being here you're helping cats everywhere uh, Allison Hunter Fredrickson, you are going to be my um, go-to person for Cat Jeopardy. If we ever have a Jeopardy program, I want her on my team. She knows a lot about cats. Um, but it's very nice to uh, be here. I also want to give a shout out to Stacy and Kristen for getting this to go happening for the Community Cat Podcast team. And I have been listening to each of the presenters, Pam, Tabitha, and Rachel. You guys rock. Um, isn't this cool, guys? Seriously, two decades ago, people may have snickered when you said, I'm going to do an on-day cat uh, behavior talk. It is now a feline evolution. People are realizing just how great cats are. Cats do a body and a mind good. So for this final presentation, um, we're going to talk a little bit about how to communicate and how to talk and really listen to our cats. So um, and you got to check out this first slide. This is my orange tabby, pet safety cat, Casey. He um, hails from the San Diego Humane Society. Uh, he's an alum. I like to use terms that are positive when you get a cat uh, from a shelter. And if for all you great people that are feline fosters, let's go with the term feline success, not feline foster failure because you got to spend some time with that kitten or cat and realized the best home is with you so i do salute all of you for um what you do but this was during a photo shoot and many of you may know i am the host of the O behave show on pet life radio it uh, we just realized that we've had the longest continuing pet podcast on the planet look at all the peas i'm popping and we've been on the air since 2007, and we have half a million listeners. Um, they're not all my relatives, so that's even better news. But sometimes when I'm hosting the show, uh, Casey has to say something. I mean, raise a paw if some of you have cats like Casey, that although cats mostly communicate with, ver with their postures, Casey's a conversationalist. Uh, if any of you have been any to our conferences where I speak or any of our pet first aid classes in person or Zoom, you can count on Casey to have perfect timing to make a comment or two. And my favorite example was right before COVID hit, we were at the Texas Pet Sitting Conference in San Antonio, Texas. I had my dog, Kona, who is a pet safety dog and a therapy dog. And I had Casey, who is a pet safety cat and a certified therapy cat. They were with me to give talks and teach pet first aid. At the end of the conference, we got in this big group. This is pre-COVID, guys. Remember when you guys didn't have to worry about six feet? And we got this group shot. 
and the photographer was from above and there was probably about 400 people and about 12 dogs and one cat, Casey, in this big group picture. And the photographer said, all right, everybody, look here, say puppy. And everybody went, say puppy. And all of a sudden there was this dead silence and you heard Casey go, no, 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 no. He's like, what? I'm the only cat here. What's this with this puppy stuff? So needless to say, when it comes to communications, we really can take a lesson or two from our cats. So I graduated in 19 bleh, from Purdue University with a degree major in communications. I was a journalist for um, newspapers and prevention magazine for more than 20 years before I entered full-time into the pet arena. Um, but I gotta say, when it comes to clearly communicating, our cats communicate far better than we do. Pause down. Um, so let me, before we begin, I want to first show you, um, if I can, is it this way? Oh, okay, come on, slide. Uh-oh, there it is. We really got to get into perspective about the evolution of cats. And I know some of this, you're like, I know this. But when you hear it from another person, it kind of sticks like wet pasta on a wall. After all, repetition is the mother of all knowledge. So it's really important to know that our cats are not little dogs who just happen to purr. In fact, the domesticated cats, they come from a gene pool from the wild cat ancestors. So they're all part of that felidid um, family. That's probably why you won't see a big uh, push on Amazon, I mean, ancestry.com for cats to find their relatives like they do with the, us two-leggers because mostly cats are all related. <laughs> In fact, there's a direct link between the mighty lion in the jungle and that tame tabby purring on your lap. So think about this and put it in perspective. About 20,000 years ago, early man saw a dog and forged a partnership to hunt for food. And thousands of years passed. And during that time, cats were just sitting on the sidelines and watching this interaction between the DOG and the MAN. They waited till about 9,000 years ago, and they began getting domesticated, uh, starting in Egypt. And of course, they were worshipped as gods. Let me check out this next slide, which brings me to my favorite acronym when it comes to our feline friends. C, A, T, and S. That stands to me, cats put the C in candid, the A in attitude, the T in tenacious, and the S appropriately in so what. Keep in mind that cats are prey and predator, but they're not that other P word, pleasers like doggies are. Cats are all about the hunt and not wanting to be hunted. The other thing to keep in mind, and I love this about cats, they don't bluff. So I say go to Vegas when it's safe with this COVID stuff and take on a bunch of cats in a poker game. You'll win every time because cats can't bluff. They don't deceive. Um, and, but they do a much better job at reading our body language and vocals than we do in reading theirs. They're also a big word, crescepcular. I just wanted to say the word. It just means that they do their best hunting and activity at dawn and dusk. They're big on catching movement. Their eyes, those beautiful big eyes. Um, cats actually don't really fully close their eyes in the so-called blink. They do more squinting and the reason is because they never want to lose even a fraction of a second to be able to catch and track moving prey. Because if they blinked when they saw a mouse, they could lose where the mouse went. I really love what Jackson Galaxy says in describing the verbs that are all cat. And that is, think about it. Here's a cat's mantra, hunt, 
catch, kill, eat, groom, sleep. Hunt, catch, kill, eat, groom, sleep. Hunt, catch, kill, eat, groom, sleep. It's a cycle. It's a cycle. And this is what a cat does. I'm going to keep your paws crossed. I have one video and it, it's coming up next. And it features one of my mentors. And she is, you guys know her, Dr. Elizabeth Colloran. She is the past president of the American Academy of Feline Practitioners. And she runs a cat-only uh, practice in Chico, California, Chico Hospital for Cats. I'm, I'm laughing because can you guys imagine typing the URL, American Academy of Feline Practitioners? Your, your fingers would be like they're doing a marathon. But fortunately, just go to cats.com and you'll be able to get some very good information, uh, more on cat behavior and health and other things. But a few years ago, I got to spend time with Dr. Colloran and her team at the Chico Hospital for Cats. And she is also one of my veterinary advisors for my Pet First Aid for You um, uh, Pet First Aid program. So anyway, so I'm with Dr. Colloran. We're in the back of her clinic where she's boarding some pets, some kitty cats. And I just want you to get from her perspective, just a short two minute video um, as she assesses each cat in their own unit and describes their personality. So I'm hey everybody, we're here at the Chico Hospital for Cats in California with the amazing, with the amazing feline, feline practitioner, feline Dr. Elizabeth Colloran, and we're in the boarding facility, and she's going to be helping us understand some body language with cats. Let's start with Zoe. Well, Zoe's well, pretty Zoe's relaxed. relaxed. You can see that she's, she's got her feet, feet not underneath not her. Feet. They're on they're off to the side. She's pretty, she's pretty relaxed, and she's sort of she's not sort of paying much attention to you. So she's a relaxed kitty. Relaxed. Kitties that are stressed or fearful will plant all four feet underneath their bodies so that they can spring into action and escape from a perceived threat. Kind of like maybe Fig? Fig's a little bit more wary of you. You can see his ears are up and forward. He's watching every move you make. He's got a little bit of a nervous expression on his face. His, his whiskers are up and his facial expression is a little bit tense. He almost looks like Toons the cat. Yeah, he, he doesn't, he's not too worried about you, but he's got all four feet planted underneath him because if you turn out to be a problem, he's going to get out of the way. And he's doing it now. Yep. It must be my deodorant stop working. <laughs> All right, what about Anakin? Because we got a bowl right here. Well, Anakin is interesting too. He's quite relaxed. He's right up forward in the enclosure. So he's not worried about escaping. He's got his feet to the side, his tail's very relaxed, and his ears aren't even up and forward. They're just not even worried about you at all. What about uh, Mr. Kitty, the vocalist? Mr. Kitty's quite the singer, but look at he's coming up forward, he's checking you out, his ears are up and forward, so he's listening to you, but he's pausing to have a little groom, he's looking around, his, his whiskers are up, and he's alert and aware, but he's not worried. Is it true that cats more, are more apt to be vocal with people than other cats? They are, and it's because we're so obtuse. We just don't pick, pick up stuff the way cats do, so they don't talk to each other very much but they talk to us because we don't pay any attention otherwise. And how can we find out more about cats? The, some of the best places are chicocats.com and catvets.com. Those are places where you can find out really good, important advice for cat owners. So just like us, there are many individual-minded cats out there. They all have very different personalities and very different ways of, of interacting with the world. Well, thank you, Dr. Colloran. So I wanted to make sure I said catvets.com, not cats.com. But what did, I hope you guys enjoyed that little um, tour of cats and their different personalities from the perspective of probably one of the world's best cat experts, Dr. Elizabeth Colloran. Um, here's the cool thing about her, too, is a couple years ago when there was the big fire, remember the Paradise Fire in um, California, her clinic became uh, like a ground zero for many people who had cats who lost their homes to these fires and they weren't they were scrambling to find places to temporarily stay 
uh, until they could get an apartment or rebuild or whatever. And they turned their whole cat clinic into a mash unit. And that gentleman you saw in the background, that's Sam, he's one of her veterinary technicians. He and his wife completely lost their home. And when they got an apartment, God love them, the first thing they did was buy a bed. And the second thing they did was buy a sturdy cat tree for their cats. Now that is true cat dedication. So let's get into, do you think you know cat, right? Uh, so let me, um, let me get to this one. Oh, I know. I, I know you guys have these little games. Um, if you want, I wanted to have a little fun. And, uh, and we just, just think about this. This is kind of testing your knowledge of cats. So true or false, do cats have flexible spines? True, they do. Um, I wish I had a flexible spine. Uh, doggies don't, kitties do. And that way, um, if you grab them the wrong way, they can whip behind and uh, rabbit punch you with their back legs on your stomach or your forearms, right? Uh, true or false, dogs hear better than cats. I, I'm joking now, I was gonna say, dogs hear better than cats, just kidding, false. Actually, cats hear better than dogs. And as you heard in earlier speakers, uh, they, they, they really can hear us very, very well. It's just that cats are kind of dignified and they're like, nah, I'll take a pass. I really don't want to be a certified hearing animal for a human. Dogs do not hear better than cats. Uh, the other question I had is um, with cats um, about their uh, taste buds. Let me just get to that. True or false, cats lack any taste receptors on their tongue. I'm making it easy for you guys. I'm the last presenter of the day, keeping it easy for you. That is actually um, uh, uh, false because cats actually have taste buds on the tip of their tongue, the side of their tongue, the back of their tongue, and those tiny little barbs, you know, that we love on that cat tongue. You know the deal. They use it to help groom themselves, but it also helps them push food down their throat. Um, but alas, cats will never be um, uh, celebrity chefs because they only have about 473 taste buds compared to our 9,000 taste buds. And here's something where I do have a little cat envy. Cats don't have a taste receptor for sweets. Um, unfortunately, especially during COVID, I seem to have found an affinity toward uh, sweet. So my sweet taste receptors are working over time. Um, the other thing is I wanted to name three ways that cats use their whiskers. Um, I think of them like uh, purring spidey, spider men, spider women. They got the spidey sense because they're able, not even touching, to detect um, prey nearby using their whiskers. And they obviously, you know this one, they use their whiskers when they're assessing whether they can fit through uh, a narrow opening. But also, and this is an important in our communications with our cats, because it's gotta be a two-way conversation, watch and pay attention to their whiskers. Obviously, are they relaxed or are they stiff? These are giving you clues to the emotional state of the cat. And keep in mind that cats actually have whiskers above their eyes and along the, the fronts of their, of their feet. Uh, when I teach kids, I teach uh, at the SPCA of Texas, they had a critter camp and I would bring Casey in and these kids were smart. And we would show how you just lightly touch the very tip of the eye of the whisker above the eye and the eye automatically closes. It's a safety mechanism. So we were teaching kids about uh, whiskers. We're now on the slide here about decoding cat chats. And if anybody knows me, yes, I do tell really bad jokes and really bad puns. So this is a cat depicted trying to be, ready for it? In cat neato. <laughs> but cats really don't pretend to be anything but who they are. Um, and it is really important. I'm gonna, because I do do a radio show, this is time for you to listen with your ears and, and let me go down some sounds that cats make. I'm gonna channel my inner 
feline. Okay, here we go. Mew, mew, mew. When you hear that sound, it's very pleasant. And keep in mind, it's high pitched. And it, it is a cat's way of getting you to sweetly do their bidding, such as mew, mew, please scratch under my chin or mew, mew, will you please give me a second treat? Here's the other sound. Listen to this one. Ow. All right. When it's long and urgent tone, it is a cat that may be in pain or a cat who's displeased or a cat who's demanding. Two years ago, Casey was in the litter box and he was just sitting there and not doing anything. And then he went, ow. And I walked over because I didn't want to startle him. And he just did a little dollop of urine and it had red in it. He was having a urinary blockage. He was in pain. Naturally, I took the evidence, the pee, and Casey, and the, as you guys know, pet emergencies only happen and the weekends before a vacation, you know the drill. So this was a Sunday night and they were able to um, um, palpate his bladder and be able to have it urine express on the table. They kept him for uh, overnight for uh, monitoring. And I'll never forget what the veterinary told me. He, she said, Arden, had you waited until the morning to bring in Casey? He may have not made it. He may have died from the toxins of the urine from the blockage. So when a cat makes that sound, pay attention. Sometimes, though, a cat will also do a drawn out meow when they realize that you absentmindedly lock their favorite toy in the bedroom or <clears throat> you're five minutes late serving their dinner. Now, in my home, I live in Dallas. And I got married a few years ago, and um, one of the cats I inherited in the Freary Brady Bunch is a neighborhood cat we call Baxter. He's a community cat, very sweet uh, tuxedo boy. Um, this cat is, I swear, has an invisible watch. He shows up on our front porch at 5 a.m. and 5 p.m. for his two meals a day. And I hear that, ow! at the door and that is Mr. Uh, Baxter letting me know I'm running late on his meal. There's another sound I really like that cats make. It, it, it's sort of like and it is sort of a musical trill that ends with a question mark inflection. And that is one that is usually directed only to a cat's favorite person and it's kind of a cat's cool way of saying, I'm really glad you're here. This one you guys know. When your cat sees the squirrel or a bird through the window, they make that <laughs> This ka 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 sound is when they are in predatory mode. And this is something to be very careful of, guys. The birds are laughing at your cat. I got to tell you, the, the birds are like, the cat thinks he's doing a bird impression. It's not working. We got this pane of glass between us and that feline. <laughs> but for you, be very careful. When your cat is in that predatory mode and they're putting their sights on a bird or a squirrel that they are trying to catch, but the, plane, the pane of glass is preventing it, don't startle your cat or touch them because you might get redirected aggression and they may hiss at you, swat at you, or worse, bite you. So it's fun to watch them, but be careful, make some noise, let them know you're there, but do not touch a cat in that mode. Of course, it's easy to know this a sound, that spit or that hiss. It's basically, as you know, a cat telling you to back off. My favorite sound that any cat makes is the purr. Um, when it comes to purring, my cat Casey, he, he has one of the loudest purrs. 
He purrs like a Mack truck. Now, my new cat, uh, Rusty, who came from Samantha Martin and her amazing acro cats, I adopted him uh, last January. His purr, he's, he's almost two years old. His purr is so subtle. Um, so it's kind of interesting. They're both orange tabbies, but one has the Mack truck sound and one has a very, very faint purr. We know that cats do purr when they're content, but it is important to pay attention to the total picture and all the clues because cats will also purr when they're scared or when they're in pain as a way to disguise any perceived weakness they may have from any predators, real or imaginary. So please guys, pay attention to your cat and put it all together and what's happening in their environment when they make different sounds. There are also physical ways cats, quote, talk to us. Here's some happy ones. We know it as the head bunting or head butting. When your cat comes up to you, lowers his head and taps it gently against your forehead or your arm or your shoulder, he's giving you a, a love gesture. He's also, though, marking you with his pheromones from his head to tell you and all the others around that you belong to him. We mentioned a little bit about the soft blinking eye uh, eyes. Um, they do the soft blinks only at people they like. And this is a gesture of acceptance. Um, it's telling you that the cat feel safe and comfortable around you. So for some of you folks that are fostering or just got a new kitten or a cat, when you get that first soft blink, it's, it's, a, it's a day of celebration, right? Now, you guys know the drill. You got to practice good manners, good cat manners, that is, and give a soft blink back. I, I remember I was teaching a class one time and a person was doing rapid fire, open, shut, open, shut eyes. And I said, um, let's go slower and not as much. Uh, so just a few soft blinks back at your cat. It's and and what I do with Casey and Rusty is I would I do a soft blink and then I take my hand and I touch my heart. It's my way of doubly telling him, I love you. I love you very much. We know about kneading, K-N-E-A-D-I-N-G, or making biscuits, as they like to call. Kittens do this when they're um, nursing on their mama. They need to um, push their um, paws on their mother's nipples to get the milk flow so they can get fed. But adult cats, some will continue to knead on favored people as, again, a sign of affection and trust. And typically, you're praying you have some thick pair of jeans, but you know the drill. They only do it when you're wearing uh, shorts, right? Or very thin uh, trousers. <laughs> All right, all right, what are you saying? Um, this one, I want you to be able, we're gonna go through some things, some observation points. I'm gonna kind of get you in the mode like I do with my pet first aid students, is you've gotta take in everything, get as many clues as you can to be able to get a better conclusion of what the cat is really saying to you, either vocalizing or through body language. So let's go here. This is uh, some key points that we um, we teach as members of the Fear Free Pet um, um, Speaker Program. As uh, many of our speakers today, we've we've taken the courses. I'm very happy that the shelter track is free. So you guys, please hop on that and get that. But when you are trying to determine what is your cat saying and how do I respond appropriately, you really do need to look at their overall posture. And it should be a, a relaxed body. You shouldn't feel the tension in the, in the coat. And speaking of the coat, it shouldn't be raised up the hairs, uh, which could be from a startle response or a need to be protective. This is a biggie. Check out the eyes. Are they soft or are their pupils large and dilated and it's you know the middle of a sunny day. What about the ears? Are they relaxed up? Are they curved? Kind of checking out things like a sonar or are they flat against their back? This is a protective mode, I'm ready to rumble. The mouth, 
Is it open or closed? Some cats will actually do a little circle opening before they're ready to bite. Tail means a lot. With cats, um, it should be relaxed. It should, it, it could be, um, we're going to talk a little bit with the cat, when the cat comes to greet you. When I teach um, my first aid classes, Casey's in the room back in the day before COVID. I will call Casey. He will come walking toward me. He saunters. And I'll go, I love you, Casey. Do you love me back? And as I say that, his tail rises in a very relaxed manner. And the very top will, of the tail tip will start twitching. You guys know that is a cat saying, you rock my world. Now, when it comes to the tails, I don't, I wish um, we could uh, really get this across for people in shelters, rescue groups. When a dog wags a tail side to side in a relaxed manner, generally they're in a good mood, but you got to look again at the total picture. But when a cat moves a tail side to side, that is not a wag, that is a lash. And if you start seeing the pupils dilating, the body getting tense, the ears flattening, this back and forth of the tail is the warning shot that they're going to attack you. Years ago, one of my best mentors is Dr. Um, Alice Moon Finelli. At the time, she and Dr. Nicholas Dodman were running the animal behavior clinic at uh, Tufts University School of Veterinary Medicine. And at the time, I was the editor of Catnip, the magazine uh, that came from uh, Tufts University's School of Veterinary Medicine. And I, she just told it like it is. She says, I am so, she gets all these behavior cases. She goes, I get so tired of people saying, I don't know why the cat attacked me. The tail was 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 going back and forth like my dogs, to which Dr. Moon Finelli said, what part of the cat bites, <laughs> the tail or the mouth? She says, well, you really have to protect yourself and pay attention to the front end of the cat too. Now, the other observation point, this is a big one. We just went through some stuff. Quiet, is the cat making any sounds? Or are you getting that low rumble of a or a that can't be any clearer that the cat's saying back off. Finally, it's really, really important to put it all into context. And that means where are you? Are you in a is your cat in a strange place? Is your cat um did you bring home a new dog? Is there a new person in the house? Are they in pain? There's a lot of things that you have to uh, factor to make a conclusion. This is one of the fear-free um, uh, slides that we use in our talks. And it really does. It's They're both kind of the same looking type of uh, uh, orange tabby or ginger boy, but definitely conveying two different emotional states. Look at the curiosity of the first cat who's relaxed. Check out the whiskers. They're nice and relaxed. Uh, they're not stiff. The ears are forward. The eyes, the pupils are not dilated. Um, the tail is actually a little bit away from the body. And this cat is chilling. This is the chill cat pose. Compared to the very agitated, stressed out cat who is flat in the ears, the whiskers are taut, the pupils are dilated, the tail is tucked and the body is low. The body is low. And look at that tail, how it's just sticking right next to the torso. These are cats that are saying, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna get you. So as uh, I think uh, it was Rachel and even I think Tabitha said the same thing. When you are um, greeting a cat, um, be very important. And I teach this in my first aid class. They really are savvy at reading our emotional states. So you need to fake it till you make it if they're injured. You definitely don't greet a new cat face to face. You do um, let them come up to you. You've done that, you've heard them say you extend the finger. It's called giving the cat a finger, but do it in a welcoming way. Don't shove it in their face. Let them decide if they want to approach and snip the finger. Because um, when you keep in mind this, if you're a cat, you have to be multilingual to survive. Yeah, you speak cat, but you have to learn how to speak 
human. And if you live in a house with other pets like dogs, you have to learn dog. And in my house, all of my pets also learn sign language. So I can do different gestures using clicker training and other things for cats to do things. So let's move on to cat to cat communications. I'm sure most of us have more than one cat in our home. And in my house, I have a 15 uh, year old cat, Mikey. I have Casey who just turned seven. And I have little Rusty who just turned two. Plus we have the outdoor community cat, uh, Baxter. Um, I work very hard to make sure that they all get along. But when I first adopted Rusty, it was in January of 2020 at the Academy that was presented by Julia Gross and Samantha Martin, the animal trainer from uh, Amazing Acrocrats, a good friend of mine, cornered me and said, um, Arden, you need to adopt this kitten, Rusty, who was about six months at the time. And I said, what? And she said, I have too many orange tabbies in my show. He loves to learn, but I just don't want him to be in a house where he's just sitting around, you know, catching one cat nap after the other. I agreed. Um, I brought him home with Casey and Casey loves all people, all dogs, but he wasn't real jazzed about little Rusty, a kitten. Um, in response, Casey hissed. I had never heard him hiss before. He hid. He missed a couple meals. There was diarrhea in his litter box. All of these are clear signs that there was stress in him because of this outgoing pestering kitten. So what did I do? Just like a lot of our speakers have been telling us, make sure that your cats have ample access to multiple resources. We added a cat tree. We did have the enough, we had four litter boxes, three plus one as, the, as Pam jo uh, Bennett Johnson was indicating. And I spent one-on-one -on -one time with both of the cats. I also engaged them more in play sessions. I made sure that they did not eat anywhere near each other so that they had time to feel safe while they're eating, which is a vulnerable position. Rusty is a feline foodie. So anytime he sees a food bowl, he is very quiet until he sees the food bowl. And then he gets up on his haunches and he makes this sound. Nah, 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 He's crazy for food. It may be because he was found in a dumpster full of fleas in Georgia by Samantha Martin. And he still has this fear of not getting another meal. So what did we do to solve this? because it's really important at mealtime not to increase any level of stress in any of the cats. So what we do is I get all the bowls ready in the laundry room, which is next door to our kitchen. And when it's time for um, our two dogs and our three cats to eat, I take out one bowl. And that is the one for Rusty. And he follows me down the hallway to the spare bathroom where I put his bowl on his serving mat. I shut him in the bathroom and then I come back and bring out two more bowls, one for um, Case, uh, Casey and one for senior cat Mikey. We have two cat trees in the living room. I position the one uh, bowl so Mikey's facing one way and then I position the other bowl on the other cat tree for Casey to face the other way. Then I feed the two dogs in the kitchen. Do you guys know what? Their poop is much better. They're not having um, vomiting. And now I'm happy to say Casey and Rusty are buddies and they will do um, groom each other, give, color, uh, give each other kisses on, on top of each other's head. Um, we just completed a, not a patio, but a patio, an enclosed porch. And we got a new cat tree in there that has three levels. And I'm happy to report that Rusty and Casey like to cuddle together on the top level. And they, they, they've learned to communicate with one another. As uh, Dr. Rachel was saying, sometimes it, you know, it takes a longer time period than we realize, but little, little victories should be embraced. Now, cats communicate 
through body posture, scent marking, and to a lesser degree, vocalization. So as we, if you ever see two cats coming toward each other, and like I said, that tail goes up, or I've even had a pair of cats years ago, Callie and uh, Murphy, who would intertwine their tails, touch their tails as they passed each other by, that is definitely a sign of feline friendship. Um, they use their scent glands, the glands in their cheek and their paw pads. They release these pheromones to the others to tell them their health, their age, their confidence level, and even what maybe they had for breakfast. Um, we know that cats are territorial. I, I kind of equate them to being feline Zoros. They like to rub their cheeks and, and paws against their favorite toys, their sleeping spots, uh, wall corners. Check out your corners of your wall and see if you find a little dark mark on it. That's your kitty being a feline Zoro. These are all signals to other cats that say, hey, this is mine. Um, and as Pam mentioned, and I'm going to reinforce it, you need to have ample resources for your cats. Uh, again, one litter box per cat plus one and not all lined up in a row. Um, but also recognize this, and I want you to pay attention. If you have more than one cat and you have like a cat tree or the top of the couch, pay attention. And I'm betting that cat A will claim that spot in the morning and cat B will claim that spot in the afternoon. That's because cats are the original time sharers. I love this. Um, so the other thing is um, pay attention when your cats are interacting. Don't be quick to bust a move and to break them up. This is where you've got to look and listen. So in the beginning, um, when Rusty was trying to play with big brother Casey, he would stalk and ambush and hop sideways with his tail up, and then he would retreat. He was trying to give kitten signals that he wanted to play. Um, I watched Casey. Casey wasn't making a hiss. Casey wasn't having dilated eyes. There was quiet, and now they tumble lightly together, but there's no sound. So cats that are playing tend to have a mute button on them. Um, what you can do, they love those little springy toys and the toy mice. So typically, I sometimes will take two toys when I think they're getting a little bit too serious. Hey, 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 look at me. And I purposely toss them one in one hand, one in the other, in the opposite directions for each to chase. It's a nice way of breaking up something before it gets too serious. But cats that are play fighting, again, they don't make any noise and they act like wrestlers, like sumo wrestlers on a, on a wrestling mat. They're kind of sizing each other up. Just intervene if there is that vocalization or the wrestling becomes a little bit more uh, hard and fast. Clap your hands or say that magical word, who wants a tree? And, and see what, what they do to be able to get them to come to you. So these two pictures clearly show the, the these cats on the left definitely are not BFFs, that's best feline friends, but the two on the right are hug buddies. Cats and dogs. The real truth about cats and dogs is if, if they're properly introduced, many can get along in the same household. I had uh, three dogs, my one just recently passed away, but all three of the dogs and all three of the cats got along. And it was kind of funny because each cat and each dog seemed to pick out a favorite dog or cat. So they watch each other and they learn through observations and through body language and scent marking. So think about this. Communication is simply a transmission of inter information. So I got a degree in communication from Purdue, but cats and dogs are using communication to transmit information. So pay attention. Um, cats quickly learn to stay out of the way when your energetic dog bounds in the backyard, in the back door from the backyard. Um, a dog learns to kind of give the cat a little space when, he, when the cat hisses. Dogs and cats share many common coping signals. They may yawn when they're stressed or lip lick or sniff the ground or engage in excessive self-grooming. These are signals that they're feeling a bit uh, stressed. 
Both species, cats and dogs, when startled or scared, can puff out their fur, depending on their type of coat. The hiss is the canine equivalent of the growl, and it means the same. It's a warning to just back off. Um, but there are also um, differences. As I mentioned, when a dog wags a tail side to side, it's not the same as a cat going side to side because that's more of a warning lash. A dog will roll, go belly up sometimes to show submissiveness. However, if a cat rolls up on the belly, he may be simply getting into a better position to use his back claws if he's expecting a fight. That's not the invitation for you to go give a little uh, belly rub. Um, the cat tail in the air in our house, um, Casey's um, favorite dog in the house is Kona. In this picture, you see the BFFs forever. That is Kona with Casey. They were adopted about six months apart. Uh, Casey just turned seven, Kona's six, and check out the body language in that photo. It was Casey's decision to come up to Kona to do a little nose touch. And look at Kona's soft ears and eyes. These are two BFFs. Every single night, our senior cat, Mikey, comes onto the sofa where Kona is and will groom Kona's head. This is the, I love it when a cat and a dog can be buddies. Um, the main takeaway from this guys with dogs and cats, you gotta play it safe. You don't want any injuries or bites or scratches. You do need to provide the cat as they're starting to get to know each other with escape routes that may include being able to quickly go up a sturdy cat tree or to dash under a bed out of uh, reach of, a, of an agitated dog. This is one of my favorite pictures. I know it looks like Casey, but it isn't. But you really guys do need to be a cat detective. If, if your cat is healthy, if your cat is injured, you need to use and tap all your senses. Uh, you need to look, you need to listen, you need to smell and you need to safely touch. These are some of the skills I teach my students in our pet first aid classes. Um, but there's also a great gal, uh, Kim Freeman. She's actually a cat detective. And uh, she, um, she was on my radio show. And she, she really does pay attention to the cues of cats. So I wanted, you to, I wanted to make sure that, uh, that you pay attention. When you're looking, Look around, don't just look at the cat, look at your environment. Listen, not only to the cat, but is there a sound that's making your cat agitated like a nail gun from a construction crew next door or uh, the noon alarm uh, or a church bell, some things that's triggering by sound, smell. Is there something in the environment that is irritating the cat's nose and safely touch? All right. This, this says it all, guys. FAS for Fear Free Pets stands for fear, anxiety, and stress. This is not what we want the level of our cats to be. But cats, as I've said, do read our emotional state. So as a fear free pet professional and as a certified instructor in pet first aid, I really get into your mental game and your emotional state when um, taking one of my classes. I give everybody I teach permission in a pet emergency to freak out later because your cat needs you now. Um, and, and I think that fear, anxiety, and stress, the FAS and the Fear Free Pets is a real game changer in helping cats and dogs I know the late, great Dr. Sophia Yen, she did um, a lot of work with uh, safe handling of pets. She was one of my mentors. And I think Dr. Marty Becker and the team at uh, Fear Free Pets are uh, also adding to that knowledge base. But watch what you say. 
watch how you say it, watch how you approach a cat, especially one that feels threatened or is injured. So I'm gonna show you a few uh, slides because when a cat is injured and a cat is feeling stressed and you're approaching, they have four options and they all start with the letter F. The first, fidget. You may have a cat that is um, showing some signs of low level of stress and is kind of moving slightly back and forth. Two, have you ever been so scared you feel like your feet, you can't move? Some cats that are so stressed out by something just feel like they can't move and that they, they're just stuck in place. Then you have the cats that will do the F for flight. Get me out of here. I need to get out of here. And finally, one of the highest levels of stress, of course, is they feel like they have no other recourse but to be um, to fight. Now, cats happen to have five weapons of mass destruction. I'm talking about those sharp teeth and those sets of claws on all four paws. Uh, you can land in the hospital with cat scratch disease. They have a flexible spine and they don't, they don't apologize. This is important. As we've been learning today from all of our speakers, you got to look for clues and see what's causing the stress in my cat or the cat at the shelter or fostering. If you start noticing the cat's really going cray cray on grooming or they're starting to miss the litter box or they seem to scratch a lot or they're turning their nose up at the food bowl or their BFF, their best feline friend, they're suddenly getting in a fight with, or, uh-oh, they, they've got diarrhea or they're constipated, or you hear them going, oh, or they're, they're sleeping a lot, or, you know, they're hiding. Don't dismiss this. You've got great people like Dr. Rachel and Pam and others and, and Tabitha. Tap into these people because these are clues that are saying something is wrong as perceived by the cat that need to be addressed. And being a pet detective, it's like being a first responder. You need to talk in terms of specifics, duration, intensity, give specifics. So I always encourage that. This started happening this time. The diarrhea started here. And so if the more clues you can give to your veterinarian and to your behavioral expert, the better chance of being able to pinpoint what's causing these situations so that a, a good solution can be um, obtained. And this is what you're looking for, guys. Some changes in the cat's perception of the daily routine, or they may have an illness. As you know, they don't really want to let anybody know they're sick because they don't want to be somebody's lunch, being a prey predator mindset. Maybe they have an injury. Maybe they have a broken tooth. Maybe they feel like they have to compete at mealtime. So think about from the cat's perspective. Our world, everyone, has been turned upside down since March of 2020 because of the pandemic. And our cats are suddenly finding out that their humans aren't going away on their, uh, during the day for work. They're staying at home. Everyone in your home, including your four-leggers, have had to adapt to differences and changes in daily routines. So pay attention to that. And I'm sure many of you, like me, have adopted a couple of pandemic pets. I got Rusty and a little dog named Emma. And so it's all about reintroducing them to the current furry Brady Bunch. So you have to be looking for all these different signs. Um, and when your cat is injured, when your cat is sick, or when your cat needs medicine, as you need to make sure that you think and respect how a cat acts and behaves. Um, they, they're not um, a species that apologizes. They do have flexible spines. And one of the greatest advice I got from Dr. Elizabeth Colloran, she said, Arden, 
with cats, you need to always negotiate and not force. So you guys know there's different towel wrapping techniques, the Pareto, there's a head wrap. We can talk about that more. I show that in my pet first aid classes. But classic example, the cat is on the top of your refrigerator or a high shelf and you want the kitty down. If you did a face-to-face -face with the kitty and tried to reach your hands up and grab the cat, you might get a claw face plant on your face. So I've taught classes now with Zoom um, and Casey's at the top of my hutch and I need him for a demo and I have to do this just as I'm teaching you. I take treats and I start putting it, uh, for, he's on the, on the top of the hutch and I drop a treat so he can see it on the window ledge or the window perch I have set up for him. So on his, and I back up a little bit and he jumps from the hutch onto the window perch. And then I have another treat and I put it on the demo table and Casey will jump onto the demo table. He thinks it's his idea. It's a win-win. And I think that's a big message. We have to have a win-win for all of our pets, for us and our cats. You know, we are the benevolent leaders, the keeper of all good resources, but I'm betting <coughs> all of us, all of us are better humans because of the cats in our lives. They teach us to live in the moment. They teach us to be clear and consistent. Um, they're not trying to pretend to be somebody that they're not. <coughs> Let me show you this slide. Um, I think it was, uh, was it uh, Tabitha, I think uh, pointed this out. Years ago, we thought we had to scruff our cats to control them, to get them to be given a treatment, a procedure or pills. But as we all know now, that just hisses off a cat even more. And maybe a cat that may be a moderate level agitation, we just gave them permission to be jacked up even higher. So we use a towel um, and other techniques to safely be able to handle a cat. Um, my cat that I got in the marriage, Mikey, wouldn't go into a carrier and couldn't go to a veterinary clinic because he would urinate and hiss. I use fear-free techniques at home. He loves napping in the open door carrier with a towel. And I practiced handling him gradually. And during his visits now, he purrs and he's very easy to handle. We did a urine draw on him and our veterinarian, uh, Dr. Deborah Charles, who also is a Fear Free Pet Certified Veterinarian said, oh my gosh, Mikey, you've come a long way. You can teach an old cat new tricks. And I want that message to come clear to you guys. We can just slow and steady. If you looked at this picture, you will see that the back legs, though, there's a finger between the legs. And that is done because if you ever had somebody put bone on bone, it hurts. So your finger between the back legs, the rabbit legs, I like to call it, is actually used as a cushion. Uh, so I wanted to keep that in mind. Um, yes, I drank the Kool-Aid. I really believe in Fear Free because it does take the, uh, uh, it, it takes the pet out of feeling uh, petrified or anxious or fearful. You want to have a good vet visit. You want a cat to be able to feel safe and comfortable at home. You want a cat to have a great life. Please guys, go to the fearfreehappyhomes.com site. I do a lot of articles for that site and videos. Um, we've got a lot of great people writing. Of course, there's a Fear Free uh, book. There's a lot of courses. The, the shelter track is free. They have a veterinary track. They have a dog training track. They're working hard to be able to get the um, a track available for pet sitters, professional pet sitters, and professional boarding staff. So look for that later this year. And I wanted to show you my team. This is pet safety dog Kona, an alum of the Rancho Coastal Humane Society in Escondido, California. And there's Casey. Uh, alum of the San Diego Humane Society. Uh, he is, both of them again are in my classes and both of them are certified therapy, 
pets. So we go to schools and hospitals and memory care centers when it is safe to do so. Um, I gotta tell you, I'm blessed. I, I have two great ones. Kona was a two-time reject and Casey I adopted when he was four months old. So he is my first ginger cat and everything they say about ginger cats, yep, he's not shy. Um, I know we're gonna open up for some classes, uh, questions um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about our per, pet first aid class, but I'm gonna have uh, open it up for questions. And finally, I couldn't end this without a bad joke or a pun, so here we go. This is what Casey's saying. He knows you got this, guys. He knows you got this. He tolerated me embarrassing him. <laughs> so I wanna first again thank uh, uh, Stacy and Kristen and Community Cats Podcast. I wanna salute the other presenters, Pam and Tabitha and, and Rachel. Uh, I hope that the four of us have given you guys some good nuggets to take to your home, to your practices, to your shelters, to your foster folks. Um, I hope you also will tune in Wednesday nights. Uh, we have Meowie Hour. Uh, it's on the Cat Fancier Association's uh, Facebook page. Dr. Rachel Geller and Stacy LeBaron have been our guests and they're still my friends. So I promise you'll learn and have a fun time doing so. And, and so I do have questions for you. Okay. Um, so I have one question. So it, when you were doing your like meows, your different meows, <laughs> the, yeah. the you long, can tell I was on radio, right? <laughs> the long drawn out meow that you did sort of talking about like showing maybe pain or displeasure or whatever. I mean, we now have some cats with dementia. So how do you tell like a meow, like a meow for one thing, but, or like a dementia meow? That's a, that's a good question. Part of it is their situation and environment. When a cat is going through the dish or the disorientation and all that acronym for cats that are um, getting to have a little kitty dementia, Typically they will make that sound like in a corner and it's almost like a, where am I? Like, ah! and you'll see the head turning. Like, I, I don't know where I am versus when they're in a litter box and it's more of a, ow. So it's like, like an, uh oh, almost. So I would pay attention to where the cat is making the sound and also factor in their health and their age. So this is why you got to put a lot of things together to come up with a di with a possible cause. But again, I am a big fan of being a good ally with your veterinarians and uh, checking it out. But the more clues you can give your your uh, veterinarian, the better. You've heard every one of the speaker, and I agree too. Take a video, take a video, and be able to show that to your veterinarian so they can make a quicker and more accurate um, diagnosis. Do you like that sound? Is that good? Sounds good. Um, I have a qu quite a few questions around fear-free. Okay. Um, so in your opinion, the, is the fear-free shelter track as applicable as the vet tract for a high quality, high volume spay neuter clinic? And if not, is there a free tract available for high quality, high quality, high volume spay neuter? The veterinary track, which I took, which made my brain hurt, had a lot of um, things about different medications, you know, that uh, can calm a cat down and procedures. It was very medically intense. I think that the shelter track I found was very down to earth, very practical. There were a lot of segments that dealt with being in a, a shelter where you're doing a mass spay and neuter and things. So my vote would be to take the shelter track. Okay. And it, is there, a, it, you just go to fearfree.org to get information on the shelter fear track? Fearfree pets, fearfree pets, fearfree pets.org, I think. Uh oh, I think you're, uh, oh. you're frozen. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, all right. So, um, what do you, and, oh, and you were frozen too. Okay. Whoops. Um, Whoops. So, thoughts and ideas about as we all start returning back to work? You're going onto oh, a different sorry. Wi-Fi or something. Oh, sorry. Hang on. Hang on. Nope. There you are. You're. Whoop. We lost. Okay. That's okay. Ah. All right. Hang on. Let me uh, go to my web thing and. Uh, um. All right. I did this again wrong. I don't want to share. Can you help me? All right. So, stop sharing screen. Okay. 
That should do it. All right, where am I? And then we'll just, I'll, I'll send you a camera request there. There it is. Whoop. Share my webcam. Here's, is that right? Yeah, I, I, well, now I'm seeing your screen. There you are, you're back. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> All right, whatever, whatever. Um, Don't type too fast, Art. Okay. So, um, well, what, what, are your, what are your thoughts and ideas about um, how cats and dogs are going to be impacted as folks start returning back to work? It, we have to be very careful to not make it so. And there is a lot of talk that uh, people are feeling that cats and dogs are going to have heightened levels of separation anxiety. So this is the time now to be taking steps to prevent that or to minimize that, which means giving your cat and dog a little bit more of their me time. They don't need to be Velcro pets. We love that they kept us sane and all, but a cat needs to be in another room sleeping. A dog needs to be with a keep busy safe toy. Um, we can't be joined at the hip at our pets. You need to start now taking little trips away. Uh, maybe when you go to pick up your food, go to the park for 20 minutes without your dog and, and with your cat at home, put on the TV or some music. But this is the time now to start getting back into what we used to do before uh, COVID hit. Um, but they, I do know that there's going to be a number of pets that may need to have medication and behavior modification because all of a sudden the human is gone. Um, but please don't make it a self-fulfilling prophecy. So do now some time to let them have a little independent me time before you have to go back to work full, full time at an office. Um, we got a lot of emails with questions before Behavior Day even started, and we've gotten a couple of more during the, this presentation. Um, lots of concerns around, you know, multi-cat households and cat aggression. So, you know, what would be your top three to five tips in dealing with aggression issues in the household? Well, the worst thing we can do is to make two cats feel like they have no options. And by that, I mean keeping them together in one room with the door closed because it's just not convenient for you to have the two cats. They may need to be separated. You need to supervise play. Meal time is a very good opportunity to make the cats get to like each other by not shoving them close together at, at, and making them eat out of the same bowl. As I said, I want, I have, Rusty jacked everybody up with this, no, 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 no you know, with food. And I had to come up with a remedy, feed him first in an enclosed room and let Mikey and Casey be on cat trees facing the opposite way and being able to eat in peace at their own timetable. And when they are done to pick up their bowls, then release crazy rusty. And, and there's no, there's no trigger. I'm, I'm minimizing the trigger, I guess. So meal times. Um, don't have uh, the water bowl next to the food bowl. That's a cause of stress. Uh, if you have dogs and cats, make sure that the cats are fed first and in a safe location. So meal time is a big stress. What was the other the question? You um, with a cat fight? Obviously, we're not going in and stopping the fight with our hands. Just throwing a towel over two cats. And if one cat goes one way and the other cat goes the other way, fine. But don't make a lot of sounds yourself because you're going to spike the level of agitation. So you almost have to be a hush puppy during a cat fight, but cause a disruption and a diversion. So disrupt and distract. Um, what else? They got to have toys. They got to have something that works their noodle. And uh, so if you have to, maybe you have a cat in one room and a cat in another and spend time one on one with play sessions. Just like they say a tired dog's a happy dog. Well, guess what, guys? A tired cat is a happy cat, too. If you work their noodle and give them some toys and things to play interactive or food puzzles, um, they're less apt to get into a fight. That said, we all know there are times where you don't like your roommate, you don't like your relative, and everything you do still isn't making it work. And they may need to have their own areas of the house and feel safe. But uh, pheromones, feel away. It's it, you know works on some cats, not all. But use all the tools in your toolbox. And so I just make meal time stress-free. Make them maybe hunt for their food. 
I use feel away if I need to, um, and I engage them in new toys and play. And, and so those are some ideas. Excellent, excellent. Um, one other question is a question about um, a kitten being sort of introduced to a dog and sort of kitten goes up and is like all playful and friendly, but then all of a sudden gets all like hissy and, and weird. Um, so what is your experience working with kittens in that environment? Well, when we brought home uh, Rusty, he was about six or seven months old. And at the time we had a 90 pound dog, Bujo, and a 35 pound dog, Kona, and a little itty bitty nine pound dog named Emma. So when I introduced um, Rusty to the dogs one at a time, I had Rusty still in his nice little carrier um, and I put him a little bit elevated above our big dog, Bujo, and Bujo was on the floor and I just kind of was at the computer and I just let him to kind of download each other with scents. And um, slowly I did it one-on-one -on -one with the dog and the cat. I had a towel ready. I had Bujo on a harness. He's, she wasn't a mean dog at all, but she looked like a big black mountain. And it was slow and steady. And I would give always the kitten a treat and then have Bujo sit and then get a treat. And slowly they end up becoming really good buddies, but I was always there to supervise. I would never ever let a, and then kittens go crazy. I mean, his Bujo's big bushy tail was such a temptation for <laughs> Rusty, but Bujo knew it was play. So cats are still, kittens are still learning manners. I would not have that kitten with a dog unsupervised until you know for sure that they're buddies and it takes time. So that's why God invented doors. <laughs> so that's excellent. Do it. Yeah, and just give them something. So the dog, the dog is very uh, rank oriented versus a cat. So make sure that you do things for the cat first and then the dog. So the dog's like, oh, that's a captain and I'm just a, a corporal. Okay, he's little, but all right, he outranks me but being consistent and making sure that uh, you give deference to the cat first, but please be safe. Don't, don't just let them figure it out for themselves. Great. Well, one other fear-free follow-up question that I missed, I meant to, um, you can take the fear-free courses if you are not a vet or a vet tech, is that possible? Yes, because I'm neither. <laughs> there you go, there you yeah, go. Yeah, and they want, you know, guys, the, the goal is to have everyone who has a pet or everyone that's in a pet field be able to learn about Fear Free. And so COVID's thrown a wrench to their um, pace of the programs that they've done. But if you go to Fear Free Happy Homes, you're gonna see a whole lot of graphics that are free for you, videos, articles, all vet approved, all approved by behaviorist, and it's there for the picking. Um, but to become certified, you do, there's just a number of tracks right now, but they're expanding them. I really, really uh, recommend the shelter track because I think that, again, it's the most practical and it can really help people that are fostering kittens. And so, and it's free. So I would really encourage that. So let's talk about your pet first aid uh, <laughs> class that you have. Like what, what, what's it like? What do you do? I first injure pets and then heal them. No, I'm just teasing. Um, <laughs> Please guys, don't, it's been a long day. Um, no, I, um, I've been a, a first aid instructor for more than a decade now. And what I taught 11 years ago is certainly not what I teach now. And that's because I have a team, a brain trust of veterinarians who are specialized in ER, critical care, cat, feline medicine, internal medicine, house call. And I also shadow ER veterinarians. So I'm learning um, and I'm a student and a teacher. And as maybe Stacy can attest, the minute I tell you I know everything about first aid, don't take my class. But what I teach now versus the, like three years ago, it's so much more accelerated. And the key is this, the whole role of first aid is to be that life-saving bridge between the uh-oh and to transport safely the pet to a veterinary clinic. I can't make you a vet in three hours or four hours, I try. Um, but I have found in, since COVID, everybody's like, oh, what are we gonna do, what are you gonna do? You can sit on your hands or you can reinvent yourself and be creative. And thank the Lord for things like uh, go to my webinar and Zoom. I have been able to explode my classes and teach people all over the world 
Our classes have people from Egypt, Germany, and Spain. Those are the recent uh, people. I can't get in my car with Casey and Kona and go teach a, a first aid class in Barcelona. So the point is this, you get to be at home and your pet's there with you. And that's a great environment to learn first aid because the pet feels safe, you feel safe, and I can I can help you through um, the, the Zoom, learn how to use what you have around you to stabilize and render aid to your dog or cat. And what I really love is this. I thought, well, let's give it a try. Let me try a three hour cat first aid class. Will anybody come? This has become now my most popular class. What do you think of that, Stacy? People want to know about cats. And we're we're wrapping co uh, Casey in different towel wraps. We're showing you how to correctly use the carrier. We all shop now at Chewy and Amazon. I have a program called How to Be a Mutt Giver. So I show you a bunch of hacks using poop bags, drawstrings, um, bubble wrap, and other things that you can use as tools to protect yourself and safely help a dog or a cat that's that's injured. And I gotta tell you, I, I love a lot of things I do in the pet world, but I'm very passionate about first aid. And I really want everyone that has a cat and cares for cats or dogs, I really think you need to take a first aid class. And I'm gonna do my best to make it fun for you and very practical. That's excellent. That's really and, excellent. And you name me another class that has a real dog and a cat willing to join a human in first aid classes. And Casey and Kona rock it for me. In fact, he's sleeping. Come on, wake up, dude. Uh, <laughs> what? Hi, everybody. <laughs> it's me, Casey. <laughs> he is my BFF. He is my best feline friend. Um, he really does uh, want to give back. You should see him in the memory care centers when he rolls in on a pet stroller with a cowboy hat. He's very kind. He reads energies of people very well. And I, I got to say, I got really lucky adopting Casey. And he's going.